being a fully secure service. But they never really documented business requirements. They didn't uh, go through the full design process. And as a result, both sides were assuming the, that the other group was performing some sort of uh, tamper detection uh, when in reality none was taking place. Now, this actually comes from one of my favorite penetration tests. Um, this was uh, one that the team did about two years ago. And uh, it's actually the uh, impetus for the talk. Um, the application had been just uh, you know, tested with automated tools backwards and forwards. And uh, had a WAF in front of it, ev everything. And uh, the, uh, we discovered fairly simple uh, URL manip manipulation that allowed you to go through every user account profile, the profile screen. So you could pull up anyone's profile. On itself, not that bad. The credit card is masked, as you can see here, with the red box around it. Everything's hunky-dory. Yeah, you're allowed to see everyone's shipping address and know all their customers. It's bad, but it's not really bad until we checked out how the credit card was being masked. It was actually being masked with JavaScript. So it was being sent client side, and then <laughs> with JavaScript, they were replacing all but the first four digits with stars. Now, they had a good reason for it. <laughs> yeah, so we, we asked the developers, what the hell were you thinking? And they said the only way they could come up with to get the right number of stars because credit card numbers are not consistent, was to send it client side. And, and if you think about it, even that doesn't make sense. I mean, you could do that server side, but I, 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 I was mystified that getting the right number of stars was a big deal breaker. But the, apparently, they were getting a huge influx of calls because the, the people had non 16 digit credit card numbers with Amex or whatever and, and were having problems with this. But, and the end result was a short script later, we'd actually enumerated 3.4 million credit cards out of the site. Um, it, this was a major Fortune 100 retailer. So we were pretty proud of this finding and, and uh, went to them and told them about this. This was again during the first eight hours of testing. Also during the first eight hours of testing, we discovered actually that the administrative password to the application was located in the Google cache. Um, th this was probably the single stupidest finding that we had had to this point. I, 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 I can't understand why you would uh, um, uh, make a, a feature like that, but um, uh, they had. And additionally, that actually left some old features in the application that they thought had been removed, uh, including self-provisioned accounts. They disabled the hot linking to self-provisioned accounts, but we searched the Google cache and we were actually able to self-provision accounts in their system as well. Um, so the end story was we, we had compromised this application at the end of a two-week engagement like no other um, before or since. The details of this uh, are a little complicated, this vulnerability, but to summarize it briefly, it's code injection. It was a rather obscure platform. Um, the result of some fuzzing and semi-verbose error messages was that arbitrary Perl code could be uh, executed on the server. Now, this is something that you could theoretically find with an automated tool. Um, I could easily write a piece of software that would go in and scan every parameter on a website testing for this attack. But the platform uh, that was being used that resulted in the vulnerability is not very common. I mean, it has its, its followers. It's, it's out there. It'll probably be around for a while. But just from an economic point of view, Automated software vendors or automated security vendors are not going to write plugins for scanning this type of product. It's just, it would be too expensive. It would make their scans too slow. And it really, from a, from a um, uh, practical point of view, that's the right decision for them. Most of the applications, though, that Trust Web tests, really the vast majority of them, have some component. Uh, be it a library that was developed in-house and is proprietary, or some framework that, while people may have heard of it, still isn't all that common. Uh, something is in, the, in almost every application that makes it unique, that is not going to be covered by an automated tool just because the, it's not common enough. So with everything but the most vanilla of applications, to get good code coverage, you really need to have a manual penetration test. So. Um 
This is probably best known as the key plot device in Office Space in Superman 3. Um, if you live in a cave or haven't seen either of these movies, the basic idea is when banks calculate uh, interest, they have to round the numbers. Uh, so uh, basically you take the leftover rounded numbers, put them in account somewhere, and by themselves they're not big numbers, but cumulatively uh, they add up. Um, it, 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 there have been successful attacks in the past where uh, malicious programmers uh, have modified bank applications uh, to divert the fractions of a cent into a separate account. Um, there's also been, of course, a lot of movies about it. Um, banks now are well aware of this, um, and I haven't heard of a successful attack in a very, very, very long time. But uh, a couple of years ago, there was a hacker named Michael Largent who came up with a variant of this attack. Uh, over a period of a little less than a year, he managed to steal $60,000 from E-Trade, uh, Schwab.com, which is a division of Charles Schwab, and Google. Uh, apparently, it's, it's fairly common for brokerages, and I guess for the Google uh, shopping cart application, to deposit anywhere from a few cents to a couple of dollars uh, into a checking account that belongs to a new customer. So that when, when someone goes to open up a new brokerage account, basically the, the financial institution wants to confirm that everything was entered correctly, so they'll make a small deposit. Uh, the idea being that they're going to make up that money from, uh, from the client over time. What uh, Largent discovered, or what he, what he ended up exploiting, was uh, the ability to create large numbers of accounts. So over this period, he created tens of thousands of accounts uh, on these three companies and ended up making quite a bit of money. Um, interestingly, he wasn't caught because of the money he was stealing. He was caught because uh, US law has certain requirements on financial institutions for preventing money laundering. And when he opened up uh, over 10,000 accounts, as Speed Apex, I, I haven't been able to figure out what that means, uh, from just a few uh, IP addresses on basically from his home internet connection, raised a lot of red flags at Schwab. They reported it as potential money laundering, and eventually he was uh, caught. He really didn't do a very good job of covering his tracks. Um, but it wasn't the, he wasn't charged with stealing the money, he was charged with fraud associated with opening the accounts. Um, I'm gonna go through this one kind of quick, because uh, uh, I've been talking slow. I, my plane caught on fire, so I've been bouncing all over uh, in various detours. I just got here a few hours ago. But uh, this was from an app test that we did on a, a, a hospital. And they had a query um, on, for patient history, payment history that would take both the patient number and the patient last name to return the, the payment history. Now, um, the patient number was a long uh, series of numbers. You, couldn't guess it, wasn't assigned sequentially, uh, it was basically private. So the programmers assumed, okay, if you know both the patient number and their last name, then you are, have legitimate access to this account. Another page allowed, on the same application, allowed either the phone number of the patient uh, or the patient number to be used to query their information. The developer, these were, were written, these two queries were written at very different times without consideration for how they would impact each other. The thing is, this was a regional hospital, so it was very easy to write a script to iterate through all of the possible numbers uh, for the, uh, the patients and ended up getting uh, their, the patient name and the patient number. Now, we realized uh, when we put the slide together that uh, the name up there sort of looks like Matt Tassaro, who's an OWASP board member. And, and uh, we want to assure you that we would never make fun of Matt in a public forum such as this. Uh, he is a valued OWASP board member, uh, as well as a trusted employee of mine on my team. And uh, I, it's purely coincidental. Yeah. So. If you take the, the information, uh, if an attacker takes the information they got and plugs it back into the original query, uh, that's all that they need in order to pull up the client's name or the client's full records. Uh, um, and, and again, this is a good example of how important it is to protect customer information. Um, uh, linking sensitive data can result in financial impacts to customers as well as embarrassing details of personal life being presented in, as a, in a public forum like this or many others. 
So this is uh, what I would consider to be the poster child for logic flaws in applications. Um, Society General is a, a major bank, has over a trillion dollars in managed assets. It's huge. Um, up until 2008, they were widely regarded as a leader in operational risk, risk management. A lot of industry analysts uh, pointed to them as a, really a role model. That changed significantly in January of 08 when uh, it was announced that Jerome Kerval had misappropriated large amounts of money uh, over a period of several years. Jerome wasn't a hacker, he wasn't a programmer for the bank, he wasn't even in IT desktop support, he was a trader. Before he was a, a securities trader, he worked in their compliance division. It's important because when he worked in compliance, he learned the inner workings of the bank's mon trading monitoring systems that basically looked in, uh, for unauthorized trades and confirmed that all the proper procedures were being followed. And he, he learned the shortcomings of those systems as well. So that when he became a trader, he was able to hide over a period of several years increasingly large trades that were unapproved. And, and eventually, uh, market changes uh, unraveled his trades and the bank ended up losing $7 billion. Now the, the details of exactly how this happened haven't been worked out yet, but we know he wasn't a hacker. It, he wasn't, this wasn't something caused by SQL injection. Uh, he was exploiting the logic flaws in the application because he was very familiar with it. So we've now reached the portion of the presentation that we actually term the stupid. Up until now, we've been dealing with the mundane, the, the, uh, the silly, but this is really the core stupid. And, and these are flaws that have really gone above and beyond uh, the ordinary uh, stupidity. This is actually one we discovered in a code review. And so to explain this vulnerability fully, uh, 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 I need to give you the background. Um, the client had a non-technical person whose job it was to review the, the application scan results they had from their automated scanner. And they'd been flagged for SQL injection. So this non-technical person read that and de it determined that the co right course of action would be to drop the uh, apostrophe if it if a, uh, a string began with an apostrophe. So just take out the first apostrophe, but really ignore the rest of the string. Um, and and he, he was actually right because it, it did stop the scanner from detecting SQL injection. The problem was the SQL injection was of course still there. Uh, and as you can see from the, the comment, the comment actually made us all laugh. That was actually in the code. Um, the SQL injection was still there, it's just that the scanner wasn't detecting it. This is something that we see a lot. Uh, this is a, from a change password page, or at least variations of this is what we see. Usually a change password is pretty simple. Old password, new password, repeat new password, some variations on that. In this test, uh, tester noticed something called site roll. Kind of sounds suspicious from a security point of view. Seven's not a very big number. Started iterating through the possibilities and very soon found out uh, that, I think it was like number six or something like that, was a full site admin. And this was a self-provisioned account. So Charles was kind of joking that uh, we should start adding a new metric to our, our reports that uh, mean time from self-provisioned account to full site admin, which in this case you could do the exploit in about three or four minutes. So um, one of our guys was testing for common usernames and passwords on an application. And he, he gets to about 20 tries and Suddenly he's logged in as administrator. So he goes back and logs in again, this time to get the screenshots, but it doesn't work. He tries it again and again, doesn't work. So he goes about his business. About 20 more usernames down the list, he gets another one, he's logged in as admin. He goes back to get the screenshot, it doesn't work. This happens three or four times. And finally, he determines that somewhere between 15 and 20 logins, you're just logged in as administrator if failed logins without a successful login attempt. Now we don't actually know what the source code looked like, but this is a, sort of an artist's conception of what may or may not be at play. We, we really, we, we were completely, and if anyone after this talk has any idea of how this could have happened, I'd love to hear it because I have not heard uh, any kind of reason for how this could take place. Um, to this day. Now it's worth noting also that the vendor in question here was a Fortune 500 retailer that, or a Fortune 500 company that everyone in this room has heard of. Yeah, big, very big name. Was not Microsoft. Uh, 